Welcome to Gospel Preaching, a presentation of Gospel Time Ministries Incorporated. I'm Dave Rigg, coming your way from my home about six miles north of Albion, Illinois. The scripture for my message today comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter 4 and verses 1 through 16, reading from the New King James translation of the original Greek text. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism." one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Would you pause just a moment with me for a word of prayer? Our Heavenly Father, I ask for your blessing now on the reading of your holy word. I pray for your guidance, Lord, that I might speak this message today as you want it to be delivered. And Lord, that you might send it out all over the world, on the internet, to the people who need to get this message today. This I pray in Jesus' name, and amen. Well, this is Super Bowl Sunday. And even if you're not a big sports fan, you probably already know that it's Super Bowl Sunday, even though you don't pay much attention to sportscasts and all the other information about teams that are playing and so on. We know that the Philadelphia Eagles will meet the Kansas City Chiefs to decide the championship of the National Football League. And many people are getting ready to watch this big game on the television. But there are some people who have spent a lot of money to be able to sit in the stands and watch that game in person. How much money? Does a Super Bowl ticket cost? Well, this, folks, will grab you. It will astound you. The cheapest ticket that I could find on the Internet this past week was selling for, are you ready, $5,500. Can you imagine that? Spending $5,500 to sit in that stadium in Arizona this evening and watch the game in person. So many people will be paying lots of money to see this game. But those of us who watch on television, a lot of times we get a lot of entertainment by the special commercials that are produced to run only during the Super Bowl. And I did a little research on this. The commercials that we're going to see on television, if you watch the Super Bowl tonight, cost the advertiser, are you ready for this, Six million dollars for a 30 second commercial. Six million dollars. Now, 
So that tells you that this is not just an ordinary football game. It's a big, big event in the year in America. Now, if you're not a big sports fan, you probably don't know a lot about football. But let me tell you just a few basics of this game. Each quarter in a pro football game is 15 minutes long. So you have four quarters. That means it's going to take about an hour at least an hour to play this game. Now, any even if you're not a big football fan, you probably have caught a few glimpses of a football game on television if your husband is a big football fan or maybe you've got friends who occasionally put the TV, maybe you've got some sons who really like football and even if you're not a big football fan, you may have caught a few glimpses of a football game being played on television. So let me ask you this. In football, what do the teams do after running a play out there on the field? You know the answer. They huddle up, right? That's right. Actually, none of the people who paid dearly for the opportunity to watch that Super Bowl in person in the stands, or people who watch on television and uh, pay a lot of money uh, to buy a new big screen television just for this event, none of these people want to spend a lot of money and spend a lot of time and effort to see the Eagles and the Chiefs huddle up out there on the field. None of the millions of people or millions of people who will watch on television are tuning in just to watch the Eagles and the Chiefs huddle up. That's not the part of football that's interesting to us. The reason people watch the Super Bowl is to see which team will execute their plays the best. The team that plays the best by executing the plan is going to win the Super Bowl. Now, I don't mind telling you that I'm rooting for the Philadelphia Eagles, but maybe you're rooting for the Kansas City Chiefs, and that's okay. But I want to say this to you. There is a much larger audience today watching a team that was formed millions of, well, not millions, actually, but uh, many, many years ago, long before the Super Bowl was ever thought of. What team am I talking about? I'm talking about the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. And who are the people that are watching this team? It's the unsaved people out there in the world. They're watching, friends. Many of the players on the team of Jesus Christ are huddled up or soon will be huddled up this morning to go to church. They go to church to be together. It's kind of like a huddle up in football. They gather together, hopefully in unity. And they receive their plays from the quarterback, who is none other than the pastor of the church. And then after the service is over, the teams, the, the players on the team of the church of Jesus Christ will then be dismissed and sent back out into the world to, to run the plays that have been, in a way, given to them by their quarterback, the pastor. And who will be the opponent that they will be running these plays against? The opposing team, just like in football. And who is the opposing team? In effect, it's the unsaved people of the world. Many people take a great deal of pride in the church where they attend. But friends, it's not what the unsaved world wants to see. They are no more impressed with the activities that go on in our church than they are with the huddles of the Eagles or the Chiefs in that football game today. Their eyes instead are focused on us as we answer the question that they really want un or answered. And this is the question. 
after we conclude our huddle ups today in the church, can we go out in the world and execute the plays that have been given to us by our pastors? Okay, let's pretend. I know this may sound silly for you to think about, but I think it's a good illustration. Let's pretend just for a moment here that the Kansas City Chiefs have decided to give up their right to play in this game. And instead, the Super Bowl is going to be played by the Philadelphia Eagles and the people in your church. I know, it sounds silly, but I think you'll get this as a good illustration here, okay? Now, offhand, I notice a couple of differences. Are you ready for this? Point number one, players on the Eagles team know their playbook. You got that? Players on the Eagles team know their playbook. And every NFL team does have a big, thick book called a playbook. So when the quarterback for the Eagles, Jalen Hurts, steps into that huddle, he tells his teammates what to do only with just a few words. He'll say perhaps, Red Dog 42, split right, on three. And just with those few words, all of his teammates on the Philadelphia Eagles offense know what they should do because they have studied that playbook. They've got it from the first page to the end. There is nothing that the quarterback Jalen Hurts could call in that huddle that could take one of those teammates by surprise. They're ready for it. They they know that playbook. And whatever the quarterback tells them to do, when they break that huddle, they're going to go out there and do exactly what that play calls for. You see, friends, Jalen Hurts has no excuse for the fastest runner that might be on that team or the best pass receiver that might be on that team or the most powerful lineman that might be out there to block for him if that player refuses to study the playbook and know that playbook. All right, how does that compare with our team, the church? Let me ask you, well, first let me say this. Your your team has a playbook too. What is it? I'll show you what it is. It's this. This is our playbook, folks. Our Bible is our playbook for our team, the church. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 say, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And then in Romans chapter 15, verse 4, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Here's the sad thing, folks. There are far, far too many people in our churches today causing all kinds of confusion. And why? It's because they don't read the Bible. Or, even if they do, many times they choose to ignore it. Now let me, let's go back to the illustration of the Eagles. Ask yourself this question. Would the Eagles be in the Super Bowl game tonight if the average player on the team of the Eagles knew the playbook as well as the average Christian in your church knows our playbook, the Bible? Oh, no. There's no way. So the Eagles are going to spend their huddle time tonight in this big football game to be sure that everybody is on the same page in that playbook. But what about our churches? We spend our huddle time being taught what it says in our playbook, the Bible, and unfortunately, Many people on our team, the church, 
don't know our playbook. And even when they sit in church, many times they don't pay much attention to what the quarterback, the pastor, tells them. Let's move on to point number two. The players on the Eagles are in tune with the will of the coach. That's, that's important. The players on the Eagles are in tune with the will of their head coach. These Eagles know what coach Nick Sirianni wants them to do because he told them ahead of this game what his will for them was to do. They received his message through a talk from their coach, and they accepted the will of the coach. But understand this, sometimes the coach's will is not a popular decision. Sometimes there are players on the team that might think, well, I think this would be a better thing to do. And sometimes the coach decides to bench a player. Sometimes the coach chooses to start a certain player in his place. But once the coach tells the team what they should do, the players are accustomed to going along with his plan. The Eagles simply have no use, again, for the fastest runner who might be on the team, the best pass receiver who might be on that team, the most powerful lineman who might be on that team, if that player refuses to live by the will of the coach. And friends, our team, our churches, it has a coach too. And who is that? The Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at verse 19, says, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward, who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and sent him as his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet. Now listen to this, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Friends, Jesus Christ is the head coach at your team, or at least he should be. The quarterback, well, that's your pastor, but make no mistake about it, Jesus is the head coach. Listen again to Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And then in the book of Acts, Chapter 20, verse 28, the Bible says, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning at verse 12, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and to be at peace among yourselves. Friends, you may not know this, especially if you don't know much about football, but out there on the football field, the quarterback, inside that quarterback's helmet, is a little tiny radio receiver. You can't see it, but trust me, it's in there. And the coach on the sideline tells his quarterback which play he wants him to run through a little transmitter that the quarterback can hear those words in his helmet. So he hears what the coach wants the coach or the, what the coach wants him to do by listening to that little tiny radio receiver inside his helmet. So when Jalen Hurts steps in the huddle to call the plays tonight, all the players will shut up 
and listen to what he says. Nick Sirianni has named Jalen Hurts as his quarterback. And that head coach expects the other players to trust him, to respect him, and to obey what he says when they break that huddle. You see, friends, Jalen Hurts speaks not just for himself, but for the head coach, Nick Sirianni. And likewise, Jesus has named your pastor as the quarterback of your team, your church. He directs your team, but Jesus tells him what he wants that congregation to accomplish. Now, let me ask you this. How well do you think the Eagles execute their players or their plays if the average player on the Eagles team obeys the coach and the quarterback like the average Christian obeys the Lord and what the pastor says? (laughs) I'll tell you this. The Eagles will spend their huddle time tonight listening carefully to what their coach tells the quarterback through that tiny little radio in the helmet. And friends, the church this morning will spend huddle time hopefully being persuaded that it's important to listen to what the Holy Spirit tells that pastor to speak to them. Let's move on to point number three. The players on the Eagles use their God-given skills. That's also important. The players on the Eagles use their God-given skills. Every National Football League player has special skills. They don't all do the same thing out there on the field. And every player knows what he does best for his team. Jalen Hurts is a very gifted passer, and he's also a pretty good runner with the football. A.J. Brown is a gifted pass receiver. Fletcher Cox is a gifted defensive pass rusher and tackler for the Eagles. And Jake Elliott is a gifted place kicker, or place kicker, I'm sorry. You won't see Jake Elliott running out there on the field and saying, hey, wait a minute, I want to be the quarterback for this play. He's not gifted to be a quarterback, but he can kick that football. And likewise, Jalen Hurts, probably a lot has been said about him already in all the pregame programming about how he is such a gifted quarterback and what he can do. But Jalen Hurts would not even think about lining up to try to kick a game-winning field goal. He's not gifted that way. Well, friends, again, this is an illustration of our team, the church. Your church has gifted members as well. They are given spiritual gifts for the purpose of using for the improvement of your team and for the success of your team, the church. Listen very carefully to verses 11 through 16 in our text today from the New Living Translation. Now, I'm not a big fan of the New Living Translation, but sometimes it helps us to understand a little better the Scripture. Here we go. He is the one who gave these gifts to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do His work and build up the church, the body of Christ, until we come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature and full-grown in the Lord, measuring up to the full stature of Christ. Then we will no longer be like children, forever changing our minds about what we believe because someone has told us something different or because someone has cleverly lied to us and made that lie sound like the truth. Instead, We will hold to the truth in love, becoming more and more in every way like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. Under his direction, the whole body is fitted together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Friends, the Bible says very clearly that every 
born again Christian has at least, at least one spiritual gift. Some of us have more than one spiritual gift. So let me ask you some very important questions. Do you, if you're a member of a team, the church, do you know what your spiritual gift or gifts are? And if you do, are you using the spiritual gifts that God has given to you for your team, your church? Again, thinking about a football team. How well could the Eagles or the Chiefs play as a team today if the average player on the team used his skills like the average Christian teaches or gives to the church or evangelizes to lost people or exerts or encourages other people or serves or administrates in the church. It's so sad, isn't it? The Eagles tonight will spend their huddle time simply preparing to break that huddle and put their skills into action when they spread out all over that field. And the church spends its huddle time every Sunday morning encouraging the members to do something, anything perhaps, to get involved in the ministry of Jesus Christ. But consider the advantages that we do have in three areas. Advantage number one, we have a superior playbook written by a superior author. Friends, our playbook was flawlessly written. Our playbook will outlive heaven and earth itself. But still, in my opinion, the eagles have the advantage. Why? Because the players on our team, the church team, they don't study it. And one of the things in the 30-some years that I spent as a church pastor that just floored me is how, many, how so many church people know so very little about what the Bible says. And why, why is that so? It's because they don't read it. Advantage number two, we have a superior coach. The plays that our coach calls are always perfectly designed. You see, our coach never makes a mistake. And yet, <laughs> this is the sad part. The Eagles have the advantage here. Why? Because we don't communicate with our coach and because we don't listen to our quarterback. How many people in your church do you reckon are regular in prayer? You might be surprised how so many of them seldom pray. They're not even comfortable trying to pray, especially in public. And they certainly don't listen to what the pastor says. It's a sad thing. Advantage number three. We have superior skills. Mm, that's interesting. We have superior skills. The gifts that the Holy Spirit provides to each one in our churches come from God. They are meant, as the Bible says, for the perfecting of the saints. They are given for the work of the ministry in our churches. They are given to strengthen the body of Christ, the churches. As a football player gets older, his skills will diminish. He can't run as fast. Uh, he can't block as well as he used to. He can't tackle as well as he used to. It's just a part of getting old. But friends, here's the advantage we have in our team. The gifts that the Holy Spirit provides to us will endure until the day we die. And yet... The Eagles still have an advantage over our team, the, co the church. Why? Because we allow our spiritual gifts to sit on the shelf. We just don't choose to use them. Much less know what those spiritual gifts we've been given are. 
and how we're supposed to use them. Well, let's close this all up. Now, obviously, your church is not going to be in the Super Bowl today. But I hope you have seen that this is a good illustration. We have a very important job to do in our churches. Our opponent is none other than the devil himself. And friends, his goal is to make our church look pitiful. That's what the, uh, the two teams in this uh, food, Super Bowl uh, are really going to try to accomplish is to really beat the other team by a big margin, to, to shame them and to make the other team look pitiful. And that's what the devil wants to do with our churches. So the question is, are you going to let him do that? Now, don't, don't misunderstand me. Huddles are very important in the game of football. It keeps the players organized in what they are trying to do or what they're supposed to be trying to do. It keeps them working together as a team. Likewise, your huddles each Sunday are very important. Christian friends, we have a game-winning plan given to us by the Lord. We have the winning tools to perform well. And we have the winning team management. We huddle each Sunday morning. But friends, the unsaved world, they're not interested in our Sunday morning huddles. They want to see us in action after we break our huddles and have spread out into the rest of the world for the rest of the week. So friends, let's break this huddle this morning and then go out and work as we have been called to do to defeat the devil and his team. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity to come each week here on Gospel Preaching with these messages that you lay upon my heart to preach. I hope, Lord, the big Super Bowl today, tonight, uh, has been a good tool for me to use to show the people, uh, especially the church people, um, how we really are kind of like a football team and how we ought to be doing much better with what we have been given to work with and how much we've spent in using the skills you've given to us. Lord, use this message today to urge more people in the churches to perform much better than they have been. This I pray in Jesus' name, and amen. Well, thank you for watching Gospel Preaching today. Hopefully, I'll get the chance to come back next week with another message from God's Word. My prayer is that in the meantime, God will richly bless you.